so now I think I I succeeded uh, starting the recording okay so so since we have a couple of new people here so let's do some some meta discussion uh, so so this is the the third seminar but the original motivation for this seminar was that I, I started to work on Seto type theory implementation and then um, there was a possibility that at my university there could be a project and then some students could be even paid, paid for working on the satellite type theory but then this funding turned out to be non-existent <laughs> but uh, but anyway we started this uh, this seminar and type theory implementation to um, uh, to make it easier to catch up with the basic principles of of uh, implementing elaboration and uh, yeah and uh, but another thing is that uh, if i run out of code or or topics to discuss now i think we have some people here who are who also have some experience with implementing dependently type languages so if i run out of uh, of this current elaboration zoo uh, series then I think we could also just uh, just keep this seminar and we can decide each week on on what to talk about and for example uh, uh, like the people here could also talk about their own implementations of dependently typed languages and the features and the consideration and, and so on okay and I think we should also do uh, a bit of introduction so so everyone should should uh, uh, say a bit about like uh, who they are and why are they inter interested in this topic okay so so i think let's let's start with with abby so Ed, are you here one second yes uh, i had to get to a, a place with less people in my house okay one second um <coughs> So I'm, I'm Abigail, I'm a trans woman, I'm a computer science student in the south of Brazil, uh, undergraduate student. I'm in my first year of a BSc in computer, in computer science and joint, joint degree with mathematics. I became interested in dependent types because I like writing safe programs that do what they say. So I started with standard ML. I evolved into a Haskell program. Some, uh, some people would say it evolved, and then I went into uh, Idris for the safety features. Now I'm interested in writing my own dependently typed languages with quantitative type theory for implementing uh, network protocols safely. Okay, thank you, uh, Albert. Uh, Albert Ten Ten Appel, are you here? Can you hear us? Okay, then, then let's let's skip. So the next one is BD. Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a physicist. I'm interested in dependent well, type languages because I want to bring more physics and mathematics equations to a better check the language and use those features to have more mm, more elaborate expression of mathematical constructs so I can write faster simulations and perhaps some better optimization stuff inside compilers yeah basically that is so I'm, I'm basically learning all this stuff now okay Chaba Hello, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm have a spare time. I'm, I have a project which I'm interested in the backend part of uh, functional language compilers, specifically Haskell and lazy languages. So I'm working on the green compiler, and also I'm in, I'm learning the backend and runtime system of GHC, and I'm interested in type theory because. I'd like to apply dependent types 
in the low-level IR to capture in low-level mesh encode invariants. And my opinion is that's the the way to go. That's the future direction of uh, modern compilers. So that's it. Okay, Gergő. So well, I'm a filthy industrial programmer. I guess I arrived that strongly type functional programming by being interested in describing restrictions on how you can use libraries. So, so that's really my main angle. And I'm mostly going to be just lurking because I've been working on a book for writing retro computers in Clash. And that's what I should be mostly working on in my free time these days. So until I'm done with that, I'll, I'll probably mostly just be attending these talks without contributing much to the career. Okay. Uh, Istvan? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm a PhD student in my first year at Alta. Um, previously, I've been mostly just using like um, dependency type languages, for example, Idris, Agda, and such. <coughs> but um, I'm really interested in how the background stuff works also. So I'm mostly just observing, not really taking part in the development. <coughs> but if I get to a good enough level of understanding, I would really like to contribute as well. Okay, uh, Mietek. <clears throat> Hi, um, I'm uh, Mietek. I, uh, I'm a recovering industry programmer, currently doing a PhD at IMDEA Software uh, in Madrid. I've been using Agda for uh, formalization purposes for about five years, I guess. And I'm working on um, a foundational model type theory um, with the idea of constructing a rather expressive language for um, for manipulating the syntax of programs, metaprogramming, and so forth. So I haven't actually built any dependently typed languages yet, uh, but uh, I've seen some of the stuff that Andras has been doing and. Uh, it's been quite interesting, and so that's why I'm here. I hope to learn more about that stuff. OK. Uh, I, I would be also interested in, in uh, what you're working on. So this, uh, this metaprogramming angle is it's also quite interesting to me. And I being, I've been doing some work in this, uh, in this area with two-level type theory, so I have some implementation of a kind of stage programming using two level type theory when the outer layer is the meta layer and the meta layer can generate some programs. Indeed. Uh, yeah, we should definitely talk about um, this. Yeah, so, okay, but but let's do that at some point l later. So next one is, is Ole. Hey, I'm Ole Fredriksson and I'm uh, very much into programming languages and compiler if that's not obvious since I'm here. I used to be an academic, so I guess you could call me a recovering academic, uh, where I worked on programming languages, but uh, now I'm in the industry working on uh, unrelated things. I hack on Sixten, which is a dependently typed language with unboxed data in my spare time. Thanks, Rafael. Yes, uh, hello. So I'm also a PhD student at LT, now, now in my second year. And uh, um, uh, yeah, generally I'm interested in uh, in in, um, yeah, in in working on improving the uh, in adding features to a type theory that would make uh, uh, them uh, that would make performing proofs in proof assistance uh, easier and with, um, for instance, by bypassing uh, um, uh, parts of a proof that should be uh, obvious by computation. 
uh, yeah and, they, and eventually I would like I would like to my work to uh, uh, well to, to, to actually to actually be part of uh, proof assistance not just theoretical so I'm interested in uh, in the implementation as well thank you sumi hi I'm a undergrad student a student at Alta and I think functional programming and dependent types are really neat and I'm really interested in how its features are implemented. Okay. Okay then. Hi, uh, sorry, I got oh, skipped because okay. I was AFK. And maybe I can also uh, introduce myself. Okay. Um, I'm Albert. Um, I'm also in the, in the industry right now, but I was at uh, the TU Delft in Netherlands. Uh, my master's thesis was also on um, was on algebraic effects. Uh, yeah, I'm a free time. I'm also working on a little uh, dependently type language. The ultimate goal would be uh, I was really inspired by Unison. So instead of names there, you uh, refer to everything with a hash, and the hash is based is computed uh, uh, computed with the uh, the actual term. So everything is content addressed. You got content address code, so I would like to do the same, but with a dependently typed uh, language. And for that, uh, yeah, I need deliberation, so that's why I'm here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and and as I mentioned previously, uh, uh, it should be possible that uh, that uh, if anyone wants to talk about their own topic or their own implementation, then we can also do that in the future uh, here at, the, at this at this seminar okay so so do you see my screen i'm yes okay where do i see the screen so i think if you so on the left there is this voice channels general and then i'm live live and then if i click on my name then you should be able to see my screen There's a button there that says watch stream and that's the one you have to click to see the screen instead of the people. Uh, uh, I should be doing, doing something or? <laughs> no, I think you Yeah, good. I can't find it, but I, I'll find it. No, I mean, if you, like Andres, you don't need to do anything. I, I'm saying that the people who want to see your screen, they need to click on watch stream that comes up when they hover over your name on the left hand side. Okay. Does it work from the browser or should I install the application? Yeah, it, it works from the, it from the browser. Okay, so so I, I think I will start. Actually, if we're doing this kind of meta discussion about how this whole Discord thing works, does anyone know if there's a way to turn off the, the beep sound when I mute or unmute myself? Uh, I don't remember, but I was able to do this. <laughs> so so now it, it doesn't beep for me, but I, I forgot how to do it. But I think it is possible. Settings, notification, sounds, ish, and mute and defend are the two options that you have to turn off if you don't want sounds notifying you of muting and deafening you yourself, <laughs> as far as I found it out right now. Perfect, thing. Okay, so, so let's start. And, and, and it so on the previous occasions, I first I talked about uh, like some some things related to, to my set weight type theory implementation in like five minutes uh, or maybe a bit longer. So I also give now a bit of an update. So, so two weeks ago, I mentioned that there, there is this uh, optimization for trying to force GHC in to be stricter, essentially, that if you have a function, if you have some, some wrapper like this, and uh, 
So if you have the strict record type, and if I write a function which goes from s of a to s of b, then usually what happens is that GHC generates a worker function, and then the worker function goes from from uh, from a to to unary tuple of b, and uh, and because of this additional s record type. Uh, basically, the strictness op appears already in the type of the function. So whenever I'm using f, so I am applying f to some whatever, like an expression, the expression can be a complicated uh, beta redex, for example. And, uh, and in every situation, if this worker wrapping, wrapper transformation is successful, then whenever I write f of an expression, then I have a guarantee that I do not get any, any tongues because this s has a strict field, so if I am referring to the worker function, then uh, there must be uh, a strict a passed to f. So this is kind of a way to, to move strictness into types, which is uh, not available in Haskell by default. And uh, I gave some example that, for example, there is the clean programming language, so this clean, which is very similar to Haskell, and clean actually has uh, has the feature to annotate strictness in types. And I think it's a very good feature and it's a bit of a shame that it's missing from Haskell. So, so I started using this boilerplate and looking at the generated core. And, uh, but then I decided last week to get rid of this, this kind of boilerplate. And, uh, and then I got rid of it and then I looked again at the generated output. And, uh, but then it, it, uh, it became significantly worse. So, so the problem is, is that if I am writing like more complicated, higher order abstract syntax expressions, so like in Setoy type theory, if I'm doing some coercion, then the coercion of, of for example, like pi something of pi something of p of t, it reduces to, to basically some, some higher order abstract syntax lambda expression like dot 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 and uh, and I have found that it is very very hard to to coerce GHC into doing the right thing if I am not using these S wrappers so it seems that uh, the, that even if the performance benefit to to using these worker functions is actually not that great it, it's probably still worth to you to use this this, this trick because uh, because it becomes much much easier to kind of force GHC into, into doing the right pattern of strictness and laziness so if I'm not using these these uns and s things so essentially if I am using uh, this s in a consistent way in the code base then s means force and un s means delay and uh, it's just a, a lot more convenient to do this than, than look at the, the core output and try to figure out why this is not, not, uh, not the correct generated code. So, I, so now I think that this, this makes sense. And if I'm not using these uns and s and just writing some random expressions here with a bunch of beta indexes, then GHC, uh, GHC just is very happy about creating a bunch of tanks and floating out, for example, uh, some beta redex out of this lambda x and then creating an extra thang so it's it's a bit of a pain and now I think that this is this is post, uh, probably probably a good idea but then we will see so so the plan is that uh, if I have some some bigger examples and I can do some larger benchmarks then I will be able to turn this trick uh, off by instead of this saying that this is just a new type. So if I convert this data into a new type, then uh, this trick just completely disappears from the code base and then I can benchmark what kind of difference it makes. And, uh, and currently my guess is that it would make a significant difference. But we will see it. And I also looked at, so, so two weeks ago, I mentioned that I don't know like what is the exact effect of this this uh, transformation uh, at the CMM level, but now I also looked at the CMM and 
and it, it partially works. And the part which does not work, I actually I made a, a GHC GHC issue. I opened a GHC issue about it. Uh, because it seems that even if even if GHC knows at the core level that something is already false, it completely ignores it in some cases in the CMM level. So GHC does not uh, even exploit the thing which GHC already knows at, uh, at an earlier level of compilation. Okay, so yes, and I also worked uh, on Satellite TT and I wrote a bunch of code uh, in elaboration and unification, and and so so really relating to the to the previous meeting. So then I talked about pattern unification, and I added a bunch of documentation and a lot of comments to the part of elaboration zoo which talks about uh, pattern unification. So I also added a kind of a semi-formal account of pattern unification to the, to the repository. So basically I, I added a mostly rigorous proof that pattern unification is, uh, is decidable and has unique solutions. And, uh, and you can look at the file, but the, but the idea, okay, maybe we can also just look at the file. And uh, so the idea is that uh, whenever we have a unification problem like this and we have a meta on the left hand side and the meta is substituted with the spine of arguments, then the pattern condition exactly says that this spine can be, can be factored into a composition of an embedding. So this is kind of an order preserving embedding of context. And, uh, and the renaming, which is, which is a monomorphism. So this is basically an epimono factorization. And this factorization is, is unique. So if we say that we have an epi, which is an embedding on one side, and then we have a renaming, which is a mono on the, on the other side, and this is a completely strictly unique epimono factorization. And this is one part of the pattern condition, then we actually do this factorization. And the other part of the pattern condition is that the right hand side also factors as, as an embedding with this kind of embedding. And, uh, and we also have in the pattern condition that, uh, that this renaming is actually a permutation. So it's an isomorphism and it has an inverse. And, uh, and that's it. So if we have this kind of situation, then, so this is by pattern condition. And we also know that, that spine M is an iso. Then we can simply cancel spine E because it's an epimorphism. So we can cancel spine E uh, on, on the right hand side, on the right side. And, and then we can just uh, compose both sides with the inverse of spine M. And then it computes this solution, computes to this solution. And because this factorization is always unique and this factorization is also unique, this means that the pattern unification solution is also unique up to definitional equality. So I think, I think this is a, a quite nice, slightly more formal explanation of pattern unification. In the previous meeting, I was only giving us some kind of hand wavy explanation. So I think that the uniqueness uh, will fail if we add a strict prop. Is this correct? So uniqueness would fail if we add strict prop. Because uh, uniqueness means that the set of variables in a term is, uh, well, we can, is uniquely determined. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, so with strict prop, I don't know, but I would guess that it still works because with strict prop, you can always just, mm, you can just kind of choose in an evil way 
uh, the strengthening of something in strict pop, which is like yes. in the smallest context. Uh, and mm -hmm. and it's, it's kind of evil because you are looking into something which is definitionally irre irrelevant, but you can still do the strengthening in this implementation level. But I, I'm not sure formally how mm -hmm. to do that. Well, I, I, I don't know because if you have, so if you have a context with uh, a is equal to b, b is equal to c, and a is equal to c, and then you and then you have some question over uh, a is equal to c, and if you also have uh, b is b is equal to c, yeah, and then you and then you do some question over uh, q. Yeah, so, so in this context, <coughs> I, I want to do some coercion by Q. Yeah, uh, and then this can be uh, strengthened to something that only depends on P and R. But, uh, but I'm obviously, obviously, it's not decidable. Uh, uh, no, I, I don't think. So coercion is completely relevant from the perspective of, of strengthening so so um oh, oh, oh okay okay I, I understand because you say that q is definitionally equal to a composition of p and r and the composition of p and r does not depend on this variable anymore then we can strengthen yes. this but 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 uh q a uh q t is uh definitionally equal to q a uh, p r t right Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't I haven't thought about this. Uh, this is a this is an interesting point. But if you don't have strict prop, then the, this this seems very correct. Yes. yes. Okay. Okay. This is a kind of. Yeah, and and it also seems that. Hmm. That uh, strengthening should be also like there. There should be no decidable unique strengthening in strict pop as well. In general. Okay. Okay. So you can look at this if you want. And previously we kind of we left off this uh, this discussion of elaboration with pattern unification. So let's just very quickly review it and finish it. And then we can move on to uh, implicit arguments and implicit function types. Okay, so, so I think we only left out uh, maybe checking an inference, but uh, we can go very quickly because it's pretty much the same as in, as in normal bidirectional type checking. So here we had this checking and, uh, and the difference compared to when we don't have unification is that uh, uh, when we have this, uh, this change of direction in bidirectional elaboration, so we are doing checking and, uh, and we can do something interesting when we have a pi as a checking type and we have a lambda and then we can check the lambda with the pi and then we can fall through that expression and uh, and when we have a hole then we are just creating a fresh meta and here uh, there is something interesting happen happening because uh, here we have something uh, which is which is not covered by any of these interesting checking cases so we have to switch from checking to inference and then we have to unify the expected type with the infer type and this is where this is uh, actually it's possible to implement elaboration in a way such that this is the only point uh, where we are using unification in the elaborator. But actually in practice, this is, this is not the only point. And in inference, probably we will see an example for another occurrence of unification. Okay, so in inference, we want to infer some type for some, some raw term and also return some term which is in the core syntax. So if you have a variable, we just simply do a lookup. And if we have a lambda, then we are just, we just simply and, uh, infer some type for the body of the lambda. And then 
then return a pi. But here we, because we do not have a type annotation on the on the binder, we also have to create a fresh meta for the binder. We create a fresh meta for the for uh, the binding for the binder type, and then we infer type for the body, and then we return the the pi type from from this a to this b. Okay, and what about application? So, so in application first we infer a type for, for this t which is supposed to be a function. So first we infer this t type for something which is, which is supposed to be a function. And then we are, we are matching on the t type. So we match on the t type and if it's pi then, uh, then it's fine. So this code is just for ensuring that t type is actually a pi type. And if it's already a pi type then it's, it's very simple. However, if it's if it's not a pi type, then uh, so what kind of possibilities are uh, then then this t tie is not a pi type? So this t t tie can be also, for example, uh, some meta headed type. So it can be some flexible neutral, and uh, and if it's a flexible neutral type. Then we want to uni then we want to unify this t type uh, with a fresh pi type. So we see that we create a fresh fresh meta for the domain. So this is a meta for domain, and then we also create a meta for the codomain. And then we unify t type with this this type and we return the domain and the codomain. So, so in both cases we just return, we are just returning the domain and the codomain. Sorry, a question here. Uh, so why do we unify uh, the t-type here? Um, would it not be sufficient to normalize? Uh, so, so we unify it uh, so it's kind of it's it's a convenience here that uh, we are simply using unification. So here, so so if t tie is a okay, uh, let's try to explain it a, a bit more. So if the if t tie is already a pi, then okay, that's very simple. And but t tie can be something else. It can be like uh, a known type, which is just not a function type. So it can be a universe. It can be in a like in a bigger language, it, it could be bool or any other inductive type, and in the cases when this t tie is actually it's known to be something else than pi, then then we are just throwing an error. But uh, but there is also a possibility that t tie is is a type which is not known to be not a pi, so so t tie could be could be some some alpha some meta variable applied to whatever t u v dot 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 so, so the unification step is to reject uh, types that normalize to something else than pi is that right uh, it does it does that so so it, it uh, I mean, there, there's two outcome, outcomes here. So one outcome is that t tie is definitely not a pi type. Then this unification throws an error because it says that, oh, this type cannot be unified. So expected a pi and we got something else. So that's one possibility that this unification fails because t tie cannot, be, cannot ever become a pi type. But if t tie is unknown, then we still want to enforce that this type has to be definitionally equal to some pi type. And we can only do that by using unification. So in this case, we say... Sorry, yeah. by using unification and not by the eval line 672? Uh, so here we are not using any unification. So here we are just saying that we create a fresh meta, but the fresh meta is a term. So then we evaluate the, the result of the fresh matter creation and then we get a value. 
And here we are again creating a fresh meta in an extended context because the codomain can refer to the domain. So right, sorry, I missed that. So you were actually doing... Uh... Okay, so yeah, I, I didn't watch the previous seminars yet, so apologies for that. So I understand that um, you are actually... Your unification handles what I call normalization. Yeah, that's correct. Right, thanks. Yeah, so unification handles normalization, and uh, and the way so the basic setup is uh, just to do a quick recap is that we have terms, and for example, fresh meta returns returns a term, but we also have values, and uh, and unification is only defined on values. So the one point of having values is that we have kind of a, an efficient semantic representation of uh, kind of runtime objects and then unification can be implemented on these kind of runtime objects in a more efficient way so it definitely handles normalization as well so at this point tty is already a value yes so so here tty is is already a value because infer returns a value for the type and uh, and here here we also have to use this forcing. So if you look at the, the previous meeting, then I talk about this forcing in, in detail, and I also have like a bunch of comments in this file uh, in the repository. So forcing is, uh, is updating a value with respect to the current state of the meta context, because the meta context kind of involves, because the, when we are doing unification, then meta variables can be solved. But then, uh, because the meta context changes over time, whenever I'm doing a pattern matching on a value like here, so here I'm doing a pattern matching and I'm interesting like distinguishing this pi case from all other cases. So whenever I'm doing a pattern matching, then I have to use this forcing, and uh, and this forcing can be used used as an extension of forcing with respect to, to laziness. So in Haskell, by default, whenever we do a case, then we are forcing with respect to, to laziness. So we are forcing if, uh, so if there is a thunk, then we are forcing that thunk and that's built into Haskell. But if we have a meta context, then we are not forcing with respect to the meta context. And that's why we have to do this whenever we pattern match the value. Um, sorry, one uh, meta comment. Um, could you please check your voice settings? Uh, your voice is cutting out a little bit. I think that's the Discord um, noise reduction kicking in a bit too hard. Uh, okay, okay. Settings, voice and video, and there's an input sensitivity slider. You can drag it to the left, I think, to help. Okay, so setting... Uh, Actually, for me, it doesn't cut out at all i don't know how that's possible but okay just, just. Okay, okay, okay 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 uh, so now i i turn i uh, i set it to a bit lower so the input volume so is it now okay is it now la 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 cutting out <laughs> Um, not the input volume, the sensitivity bar. Oh, the, the sensitivity bar. Okay, la 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 la. Uh, now it sounds terrible. Yes, it is now very, very bad. Uh, there is a lot of background noise and hissing and... Uh, this now it sounds like there is a wind tunnel. And now I, I, I set it back to auto. Is it is now okay? I can also just try to talk a bit um, uh, quieter. I think that the actual problem was the increase in the input volume because it amplifies every background noise and distorts your volume, uh, your voice. So I would uh, reset the input volume to where it was and maybe just adjust the sensitivity. And now the input volume is where it was. So, okay. I'll try to exit the settings because it only took effect after you had just it last time as well. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. Okay. 
Okay, so what should I do now? <laughs> Istvan? I, I don't know, but it's still bad. Um, so you reset your input volume, and I don't know, maybe don't try resetting the same PD as well. Uh, uh, so now I turned the automatically determined input sensitivity off. So what about now? Yes. That's incredible. I don't know. Okay, I have no more ideas. I would. And, and what percentage is that? It's uh, 100. So the input volume is, is 100%. Percent. Okay, I would lower it. And it was 100. And it was one. Let's try 50. I don't know. I lowered it to 70. Oh, it's quiet now. Maybe 90. Okay, now it's 90. Now the distortion is gone, but the background noise is still there. But I don't know, it's bearable probably right now. Uh, maybe the others can tell. Se 70 was better, I think. 70. Okay, maybe 80. Now what? This is good. This is good? Yes, it's definitely quieter than like it was before, but there is no noise, at least. Okay, but what if I also do something with the sensitivity? The sensitivity is only a threshold where if it, your voice is below the sensitivity, it completely turns turns off transmission, and if it's above, then it transmits your voice. So it's just um, for cutting out silence. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, uh, at least it's not supposed to affect the voice quality or the volume or anything like that, so as far as I know. So now you're, you're hearing some, some background noise? No, not. Now it's good. Let's continue this way, I think. OK, OK. OK, let's continue. <laughs> I have a question. So, so I thought I understood this before me at X question, and now I don't anymore. So if you didn't do the unify on, on line 674, and if you only did the variation, but then, then I see that uh, E and B would be fine as a type in the sense that there would be no constraint on them, so they would be just arbitrary meta variables which might as well be a phi type, but then there would be nothing that ties them to the type of the function we're trying to apply, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, so we are trying to apply a t, so t must have a function type. So there is no, no way around this. So we can only return a well type expression from this raw application if t is actually a function. But so that, that's why I'm now confused because Mietek's uh, Mietek question and your answer to that to me implied that it's not obvious that we need n674. Mm, okay, this would also work. So this would also work, right? But uh, but this would be less convenient from a user perspective. Sure. So so we say that. Okay. So on the other hand, this would also work, right? Um. So this would also work, but this would be actually worse from performance perspective and also worse from an uh, error message perspective, I think. What this would be, uh, th is this like an ETA expansion now? Uh, no, now we, now we say... Oh, this, would, uh, this would just make two new meta variables and, and uh, solve them to be A and B. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So, so this would immediately make two meta variables like make two meta variables which are unnecessary because they are immediately solved. Yeah. So so this is basically how it how it works in in the usual classic Hindley Miller, where we do not have bidirectional algorithm like in the classic explanation of Hindley Miller inference. We only have this. But. Uh, but this, but this is kind of a basic optimization, and it's used used very commonly.
okay so 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 can i continue okay then i i just continue yeah so so this code uh, it ensures that theta is a pi and and returns the domain and the codomain and then we can check that the argument in the application actually has a domain type and then we can return this application which has this uh, this uh, instantiated codomain type so here we have b so b is b is a closure and this dollar dollar is closure application so we just apply b to the value of, of the of the argument so this implements the usual substitution rule in the in the typing of application for pi so we are returning some b and then this is substituted with in this way okay and and here we are just again just using the typing type rule so u has type vu and with pi we are we just check that the domain is a type and also the codomain is a type and return a pi with let uh, we kind of just just fall through again and uh, this is also a bit interesting so when we are trying to infer type for a whole then the only thing which you can do is to create two methods so first we create a method for the type and then we also create a meta for for the whole itself and then we can return the two metas okay so so this is it so so yeah so elaboration does not really change in a, in a very significant way compared to just bidirectional type checking and then maybe Maybe we can also look at some examples. So here is this example file, and then we can have an identity, polymorphic identity function, and then we can also have some church encoded lists. And, uh, and probably I just skip this example because all that happens is that here, whenever I'm writing a whole, then in this particular positions, the holes can be inferred. So I think uh, let's move on to uh, implicit argument. And now we have a bunch of files because I decided that it was too long. So it kind of crossed the threshold of uh, being sensible, sensibly in a single file. So I, I just split it to a bunch of different, different files. But uh, but first I can also just, just give a, a quick overview of uh, what, is, what is the idea maybe in this file and probably I should also restart GHCI because I changed to a different package and it seems that now it's correct okay so what's the general idea so the gen general idea is that uh, and this this will be kind of a, a rehash of of uh, of what's in my in my uh, implicit functional operation paper But we will not talk. Okay, maybe if there is time, there is time, then uh, we we can talk about like the advanced solutions, potential advanced solutions to this uh, implicit function elaboration. But uh, but it is not necessary. So it's, it's it's completely usable if you are only want to uh, redo the same behavior as in Agda. So here, yeah. 
So in this package, in the repository, we are just reproducing Agda. Here we are. Slightly weaker than Agda, but very similar to, to Agda behavior. And uh, so the idea is, is that we don't even want to write host everywhere. So, so we want to we want to tell the compiler that uh, that uh, particular arguments should be inferred by default. So it's a way of controlling elaboration. So yeah, so in, in the core syntax, so in the core syntax, the distinction between an implicit pie type and an explicit pie type is almost irrelevant. So. Uh, they both behave exactly as as pie types, but they are distinguished. So we have explicit and implicit pie, and uh, and they are both just pie. And in the core syntax, nothing interesting happens when we when we are doing, for example, evaluation of an explicit function as opposed to evaluation of an implicit function. So the, the only reason that we want to distinguish an explicit and implicit pi is because we want to use them to control elaboration. So, so we only distinguish them to control elaboration and, uh, and this means that there is kind of a feedback from uh, from the evaluation to to elaboration so so elaboration will make choices based on whether a pi is is implicit and how how does this work so the so the way it works if i say in agda that id should have have type a set A arrow A, then uh, if I'm defining this fun function simply as lambda x arrow x, then I actually I want to elaborate this this lambda to to this lambda, and whenever I am using id, so if I'm using id like id then I want to elaborate this to to ID of true of true <coughs> and the way this can be implemented is that that uh, when the elaborator checks along the type if the checking type is an is an so sorry so when, when we are checking a lambda and the checking type is an implicit pi then the elaborator can insert an additional lambda with an implicit binder. And when we are uh, when we are trying to infer this application, then the elaborator sees that ID has an implicit pi type. So we can insert an additional implicit application here. It wouldn't make more sense to say that we elaborate it to ID and then a, a meta and then true because then it it's bec it becomes orthogonal to solve the meta and to insert it. Uh, yeah, the way it works is that we insert a, a meta. Uh, exactly. So so that that's how it works. <laughs> but uh, but then it's immediately solved to bool. So maybe it's it's not essential for illustration purposes to say that here we are inserting a, a fresh meta. Okay, maybe not immediately, but when we are we are checking through, then it is solved, solved to to bool. So I, I think the point is, is that whenever we are checking with an implicit pi, then uh, then we can in insert an implicit lambda, and then whenever we are inferring an implicit pi, then we can uh, we insert an implicit application. So checking with. This then insert lambda and inferring 
x a b then insert insert an implicit application um so does this reproduce the uh, famously annoying Agda bug with regards to inserting implicits, or does this actually reproduce your solution to the Agda bug from your paper? Uh, th this is uh, this is just the Agda, so it, so this does not yet attempt to solve any Agda bugs. Thanks. This is just just Agda, and uh, of course uh, this is not uh, literally the case because uh, it is also possible that we are checking an implicit lambda with an implicit pi type and then of course we do not want to insert an implicit uh, an extra implicit lambda so this insertion only happens if we are checking something which is not already an implicit implicit lambda Okay, and but and uh, I can also quickly talk about like uh, what can go wrong if you are doing this kind of implementation, and what can go wrong is that the checking type is not necessarily a known type, so the checking type can also be can be some meta applied to a spine. And in this case, we have no idea whether this is a pi or, or not. So, so in this case, it is possible that later this alpha spine will be solved to a pi to an implicit pi. And in that case, the correct solution uh, or the correct choice here would be to insert a lambda. But it is also possible that at some point later during elaboration this expression will be solved to some type which is definitely not a not an not an implicit pi time. And in that case, the correct choice here is to not insert an implicit lambda. So there is a, at the point of checking, it is possible that we only have incomplete information. And all the bugs related to, or maybe not bugs, but kind of inconvenient implementations related to, to this basically arise from this from this problem. So if the checking type is not known, then we have to make uh, some kind of unforced choice during elaboration. And Agda, Agda says that we don't insert. So if we don't know, actually know the checking type for sure, then Agda says we just don't insert. And that's, that's where the bugs come from. Yeah. Okay, and for example, what does what does GHC, GHC do in this situation? So GHC is even worse because GHC says that we don't even allow uh, meta variables to have implicit function types. So in GHC, this is this possibility is just completely uh, prohibited. So there is, there is not a chance that, that this alpha spine can be solved to an implicit function type because it's completely disallowed in GHC's uh, elaboration mechanism. <coughs> yeah, and, th and then there is an also kind of a, a dual problem. So the dual problem is that, uh, so whenever we infer so infer an unknown type again like a, an alpha spine then we don't know whether we should insert an implicit implicit application yeah But this problem is actually it is way way harder to solve, so a lot harder to solve than other problem. And uh, there is essentially there is no real world language implementation which solves this problem. There is there is only uh, MLF 
algorithms can solve this, but they are ridiculously complicated. Um, what does MLF stand for? So MLF is a, it's a, I'm not sure. So basically, with uh, with kind of this type inference algorithm, the algorithms they are just these kind of abbreviations all the time. Uh, so MLF is probably we have the ML language, and MLF is kind of extending ML to arbitrary system F types. And uh, if you can, if you have arbitrary system F types, then we have higher on polymorphism. And for some reason, they thought that uh, type inference should be extended to handle higher on polymorphism in a in a very strong strong way. But then. This system turned out to be really, really complicated, and it's not implemented in any real world system. Okay, but, but this is not quite as complicated, so this can be realistically solved. And my paper is one possible solution to, solve, to, to address this problem. Okay, but, but let's, let's look at what happens in the implementation. So, but now it's, it's kind of split into, into a million files. Uh, let's first look at the syntax. So, so in the syntax, what changes is that, uh, that lambdas and pies are annotated with this isit. So an isit is defined to be either impl or expl. And, and it should be quite obvious how it works. And otherwise, the syntax is uh, the core syntax is the same. We we only have this additional isit annotation on uh, on labdas applications and also pies. Okay, and what about values? So with values, now we have an extra isit on spines. So this spine uh, uh, represents kind of an iterated application. So we have this uh, spine neutrals. Uh, which I talked about the last time. So values are either a flexible neutral, and the fle flexible neutral is a is a meta applied to uh, to some some number of values, and in each application here is annotated with an isit. Okay, or it can be also a rigid neutral. And this is a De Bruyne level. So in values, the, the variables are represented with De Bruyne levels. And we also have a lambdas, and the lambda is annotated with an isit, and it has a closure for a body, and pi also has an isit and also has the usual closure for body. And if you look at the evaluation, then uh, where is the evaluation? Then nothing really changes. So it's almost exactly the same as previously. But we have to propagate all, all of these i i's, which uh, which stand for the isit isitness of functions. Okay, so here here nothing really changes. And, uh, and unification is also very similar to, to last time. <coughs> so here, the only change is that we also have to enforce that the isitness of, uh, that the isitness is, is the same. So if we are unifying two pi types, then we say that an explicit pi is not the same as an implicit pi. And some people, uh, some people have suggested that maybe there should be some kind of implicit subtyping or conversion between <laughs> between the two kinds of function types. But to me, it sounds uh, like a, a nightmare to try to implement this. <laughs> and and uh, and probably it would be unsound. So I think Torsten suggested that. Uh, so what if I? If I want to implicitly convert between an implicit function type and an explicit function type, 
but I, I think it's, it's actually not sound because elaboration makes choices based on whether I have an expo here or an impo here. So, so elaboration makes some choices and uh, then it would not be probably correct to say that two types which are distinguished by the elaborator are actually equated by the unifier, right? But this is this is kind of just a just a side comment. So probably we do not want to distinguish things which are unifiable in any way. Um, could you say what is the reason to distinguish uh, between implicit and explicit pie types um, in the core? Is it simply to give the user back what they expect? Mm, okay, so. So the, the, the reason to distinguish in the core is that uh, so in the in the core I want to evaluate core pi into value pi right so if I start with the core pi I do an evaluation and then I get a I get a v pi and then uh, we will shortly get to that that part but elaboration makes choices based on whether this is implicit or explicit so if I want to if I want to be able to make this choice, then I have to propagate this implicitness information, and it must be also present in the core syntax because if it's not present in the core syntax, then it it won't be present in values. And and what I mentioned just now is that because elaboration makes choices based on implicitness then it would not be uh, very well behaved if I say that elaboration behaves differently on these two types, but unification says that these two types are the same. So it would be like, okay, we could implement this, but I, I, I think that it would be very, very weird to say that. No, th this part is, is clear, thank you. Okay. Okay, so, so let's get to elaboration because that's where the, the action happens. Okay, so once again we have fresh methods and we have this wrapper which is basically it's just, uh, just catching the unification error and just wrapping it into some more informative error message which also contains, it captures the context and it also includes a source position and whatever and so we are just converting some internal unification error into some, some nicer elaboration error, which can be displayed together with positions. Okay, and, and uh, yeah, it can be more sophisticated. So we, we could also distinguish different kinds of unification errors and also have like uh, two levels of unification errors. So in Idris, for example, if you get a unification error, it says something like, I can, like uh, t cannot be unified in u while, and then it also gives you some two larger expressions while trying to unify this larger expression with another larger expression. So this is kind of the, just the simplest way of implementing uh, unification error. <coughs> okay, and now we have these, these two, these three different things. And maybe they are not named uh, very suggestively, but this part is exactly the same as, the, as in my uh, implicit functions paper. So, so what is this? So this insert prime. Uh, so, <coughs> so it, it takes an action which, which uh, performs some inference. So inference returns a core term together with a type. So this is just some IO action which performs inference and I want to convert it into some other I action, which performs the action and also performs uh, insertion of implicit applications. So what I do here is that I perform this action and, and then I, I do this goal. And the goal looks at the type, it looks at the infer type and if the infer type is, a, is an implicit pi then uh, it inserts an implicit application and otherwise it just stops and returns the, the current results. 
given that all this seems to do is run the action and then depending on its return value do something why, why is it written as a transformation style uh, because it's it's convenient because there are different different actions which which have, have this type of sorry so like in different contexts i have different things with this type so it's only a convenience that uh, so it's it's basically this way it can be used as an optional post-processing step whenever I'm doing an inference. Okay, and, uh, but I have this, these uh, two different insertion functions and this, uh, it only looks at the type and just, just performs the insertion. But this one, it, uh, it's kind of a, a wrapper and uh, so we are only doing an insertion to something which is not an implicit lambda. So here we are performing an action and then we are looking at the, the term, which is the output of inference. And if it's already an implicit lambda, then we are not doing any insertion. But otherwise we are doing insertion as usual. And, and this is also part of the lambda behavior. So part of lambda behavior. Although I think that this implementation is actually a lot more elegant than the actual Agda implementation, but it, it reproduces the Agda, Agda behavior. And, uh, and he, initially I wanted to skip this, but then I realized that, uh, that it, it is very counterintuitive if I, if I skip this part. Because then what happens is that uh, whenever I, I write, uh, so whenever I write, an expression like this, like here we have a, a lambda x t, okay, and maybe we can also have an explicit argument, so we have a lambda, an implicit x and an explicit y, and then we have a t, and we apply this to u, so this is kind of an implicit beta redex. So whenever we are doing this, then if I'm only using this insert prime, then this just results in some completely unsolvable problem. Because, uh, it, because what happens is that it, okay, sorry, term which is not an implicit lambda. Yeah, so here, here what happens is that elaboration inserts a fresh meta. Okay, so I was wrong. So, so insert would create an implicit beta index. Because insert looks at this and it just does insertion. And then because this is an implicit lambda, it immediately creates an implicit beta index. But because this beta index is, is applied to a fresh meta variable, like uh, it completely computes a way, so there is no way to constrain this meta. In some really, really weird situations it can be solved, but 99% of the time it cannot be solved. So that's why we are also using this insert function and usually we, we use this insert function. Another example, for why we need this insert is that <coughs> I just want to do, for example, um, I don't know, maybe a top level definition or a let definition. I say that let f equals a set x a dot x, right? So maybe for some reason I want to do a lat definition and I do not want to repeat the type annotation and the lambda, I just want to write a type annotated in lambda. I mean, even in Agda sometimes I write code like this. And, uh, and if this is elaborated to let it f, so 
So this is a lat expression without a type annotation, and uh, how I usually do it is that I elaborate un unannotated lats to, to annotated lats. So here I would create a fresh meta for the type of f, and then I would try to check check this this expression with with the fresh meta. And then I would just immediately switch to inference. So I would uh, I would try to infer a type for for an implicit lambda. So infer type for implicit lambda. Uh, but if I'm doing this, then in general I, I'm doing an insertion after every inference. So so I would also do an insertion because this is an implicit lambda expression. I would immediately try to apply this implicit lambda expression to, to a fresh meta variable. So the result would be something like, uh, like this, which is pretty much nonsense. So, so this is not it, how it works in Agda and, and we wouldn't want this. Okay, maybe this is a bit too much detail, but... Uh, um, sorry, before you delete this, uh, could you say for both examples, what is the uh, behavior that we do want? So the behavior that we do want is that... Uh, so if I'm, if I'm inferring something... Then, uh, so whenever I'm, I'm doing inference, I only want to perform insertion if, uh, if the term is not already an implicit lambda. So in this case, I'm trying to infer time for this implicit lambda and uh, so I do not perform insertion because if I would perform insertion, then it would look like this. And that would mean that there is a, a kind of an immediate implicit beta redex and I do not actually get a polymorphic identity function. So I would get this function the, and also an unsolved meta variable. And in Agda, this works. So if in Agda, if you write this kind of let expression, then f will have the polymorphic identity function type. And that's generally what we want to have. So we say that uh, if we are doing insertion, then we, we don't do insertion if the term is already an implicit lambda. And that's why we have these two, two functions. So in line 62, was the meta beta the beta meta was that supposed to be uh, in uh, in yeah thanks right okay yeah. got it yeah okay <clears throat> so and this is this is also in my in my paper but but this is not in the paper so this is just a kind of a, a slight extension of insertion behavior so it inserts fresh implicit applications until we hit a pi with a particular binder name. So this implements uh, the named arguments in Agda. Yeah, so here what happens is that I have some, some inference action and then I perform it and uh, and I just look at the type and, and if the name matches, then I immediately just return the result. And if the name doesn't match, then I just keep inserting until I, I hit, the, hit the name, right? So, so if you know that I do something like a const, which has an A, B set A, B, A, then I can write like a const and then I only give B. So 
my same ABB equals bool. And here, what should happen is that I first I infer a type for const. But, but after I infer a type for const, I want to keep doing insertions until I get to the B argument. So that's where, that's where we are using this insert until name. <laughs> and if there is no such name, so if, if there is no B argument in this type, then we are just throwing an error. Okay, so let's look at checking and inference. Mm, yeah, so, so this is kind of the new thing. <coughs> so, so one thing is that if the isitness, so we have a checking type, so we have this force A, which is the checking type, and then we also have some preterm. So now I, I have a, in a separate module, so I have preterms in a separate module and I import them using this p dot uh, qualification. And, uh, and if the preterm has the same isitness as the checking type, then I, I just do as usual, right? So for example, if I have a, a lambda x dot t, and I want to check lambda x dot t with an x a b, then I just go under the binder and do nothing interesting. And likewise, if I have implicit binders on both sides, then again, I just go under the binder. So in this case, just go under binder. However, if, so here, t, is, uh, is not an implicit, um, so here, this can be a lambda, right? So this t can be a lambda expression, but the, the isitness or the isity, as Gallagher suggests, so the isity uh, does not match. So there are two possibilities here. So in this other bias, two possibilities are kind of compressed, so two cases. So one case is that t is not lambda, right? And the other case is that t is lambda, but, uh, but it's explicit. And in both cases, I should insert a new, new implicit lambda because the checking type is an implicit function type. So elaboration has to return some term, which has this type, right? So the only way that elaboration can return a term with this type is, uh, is if it inserts a new implicit lambda. For example, synagda, like the, the simplest example, again, like the, the identity function example, that I have an ID A set AA, and then I say that ID is defined only as an explicit lambda. And then elaboration takes this type of notation and it checks this explicit lambda. So we have this case. So T is a lambda, but it's explicit. So we need to insert an additional lambda a. <coughs> and, and, uh, and it can also happen that, for example, uh, so like, what, what is an example uh, where t is not a lambda? So like, for example, we are using not alim and uh, like the induction principle for natural numbers, and then we say that we have a p from n to set, and then we have a for all n, p m, p, p sucken, 
and then we have a p0 and then we have for a lan p of n so if we are using this kind of induction principle for natural numbers here we have a higher order function such that uh, there is an implicit function as, a, as an argument and then if I only want to do non-dependent elimination then uh, then what happens is that p is just uh, just defined to be some some constant function <coughs> and then I have to I have to give some function for uh, for the successor case so function for suck case uh, okay this is actually not a good example because here uh, it's, it's going to be a lambda uh, probably anyway but you can imagine that uh, but if I if I'm doing some elimination and this this p, so this is not a function but this is some kind of arbitrary other type, then uh, the situation can arise that I have a for l n, p of m for example. I want to prove this, right? And p of m could be just bool or whatever. So, like, try to prove maybe for l for l n pm where this is implicit and uh, and uh, if p is just some constant family then then we, uh, then we want to do something like this so if p is just constantly bool and i want to write true and then true true has type so true checks at for all n dot bool and uh, it's elaborated to to lambda n dot true right so I'm sure that this also happens a lot in, in practice So, so this is the behavior for, for implicit lambda insertion. And, and we all, we've already seen the implementation for implicit application insertion. So basically, so we have these three functions for insertion, and then we have these two cases for lambdas. And, and that's it. So that's the only difference compared to, okay, okay, actually not, not all differences because in checking is the only difference. Uh, Okay, I, I should just stop saying this. So there are there are several more differences. So another uh, another difference is that here we have an inference. So this is the change of direction. Change of direction, <coughs> and then we do an inference, and we also want to do an insertion. And in general, whenever we do an in insertion, uh, so in, in lead definitions and this, in this change of direction, we want to do an insertion whenever we do, do an inference. Can you explain why is there an insertion for the change of direction? Okay, so let, let's give an example. Uh, what, what should be a good example for this? Mm. For example, I'm checking. Uh, I'm checking the polymorphic identity function with a with a meta type. So, for example, checking checking ID with, with alpha spine. So if the if the checking type is unknown, then none of these cases are are valid. So if the checking type is unknown, we just fall fall to this, right? 
course, it could be a hole or it could be a let, but if it's if it's not a let or not a hole, and we have an unknown checking type, then we fall to the change of direction case. And this happens, for example, when I want to write like let f equals id in, and then I'm using like blah, 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 and I'm actually mentioning f in the code, for example. And then here, because f is not annotated, it's just defined to be id, or, or maybe f could be some, some other interesting uh, polymorphic function, like, I don't know, like replicate for vectors, uh, maybe replicate, uh, let, let's just keep it id for simplicity. Then, uh, then the right behavior is that, uh, or the intuitive behavior and also what, what is happening in Agda as well, is that here I'm checking id with an unknown type because f is not annotated, but I want to, I want to apply id to, to, to a fresh meta variable. So I want, want it to be like, like this. And then, of course, I have to use id in a monomorphic way in, uh, in this particular expression. And, and the reason that it, it should work like this is because um, uh, we, we don't want to have this kind of like let generalization locally. So whenever I have a local definition, I want the local definition to be monomorphic. So here, if I'm defining f to be id, then I, I want this definition to be some, some function type, which goes from a to a, but from some particular a to, to the same a, and I don't want this to, to be a polymorphic id. Sorry again, but this seems like a choice rather than something obvious. Stop me if I'm asking too many questions, but... Okay, um... okay here, here you are right, so this is a choice. And um, if you only have this system, so if you only have a system which, uh, which is in this project, then uh, this is a choice. Uh, sorry, so if, if you only have the system which is in this project, then, then this is the natural choice. But if you have a stronger system, so if you have a system which is more like in my implicit functions paper, then, uh, then we can choose e uh, either way and it works nicely. So, so if you have a stronger system for, uh, for inferring implicit function types, for example, in my paper, my paper can make a delayed decision about whether this ID should be polymorphic or not. So in my paper, so the decision that id should be polymorphic or not can be delayed until it becomes obvious. Because here, if I'm using f in a polymorphic way, then we get the polymorphic type. But if f is only used in a monomorphic way, then we get the, the monomorphic type. Thanks. But in this project, we do not have this mechanism. So in this project, um, the, the simple thing to do is, is just to say that we do not have, uh, we do not keep around this possibility of polymorphism. We just say that local bindings are, are monomorphic. Okay, and, and what about inference? So, so in inference, we, we also have this phenomenon that, for example, if I try to infer a type for a lambda, then uh, it involves some inference. And I also, I want to do insertion even for lambda bodies. So for example, if I, if I do an inference for, so infer lambda x dot id, then this becomes 
lambda x dot ib alpha. But this alpha can, of course. So is, yeah. is this where the usual like, the problem starts? Uh, no. <laughs> no, the usual other problem is with, uh, with the insertion function. So the usual uh, so this we already have the usual algebra problem because here we say that if force VA is implicit, then we insert, and otherwise we do not insert. And here VA can be can be also on at all. Maybe I, I can also give an example for for this this usual algebra issue. So, so my, my, my kind of my standard example is that uh, if I have some foo with type maybe a set a a, <coughs> then I want to define foo to be just of lambda x x. Then what happens here is that I first I infer a type for foo, uh, for just. So infer type for just, and uh, it's a polymorphic type. So it's a, an A set, A maybe A. Okay, so I insert. Maybe you maybe you want to use a different n name than A. Why? Because you will end up with using it where a is equal to a to a, right? No, no, no. Uh, th this is fine. This is fine. Uh, let's continue. And I think I think this is fine. I, I put this into my my ICFP presentation, so I think this is. <laughs> no, no, no. I just mean didactically. I don't mean that it's going to be a technical problem. I'm just saying that because you will end up with a unified with a to a, it's just going to be needlessly confusing. Um, okay, okay, okay. Ah, you have a point. I mean, it's not confusing for me, but maybe I'm too used to this <laughs> substitutions. Okay, so then we do an insertion. So because just has this polymorphic implicit function type, we do an insertion. So here we have just of alpha, and then that has type alpha arrow maybe alpha. Okay, and then then we want to check lambda x x with alpha. But because this is just a meta variable, we, we don't insert. And uh, we cannot insert because we can only insert if this is an implicit pi. So we, we not only don't insert, but actually we cannot insert an uh, implicit lambda. So we just continue without inserting an implicit lambda. But then what happens is that this expression elaborates to just alpha and then lambda x x with, uh, with infer type. So the infer type will be maybe uh, uh, some beta right so it, it will be maybe some beta arrow beta because here we have a lambda and then we, we infer infer a type for this lambda xx and the infer type is going to be just some some uh, some function type going from a fresh meta to the same fresh meta and then we also solve this alpha to be this type so what we get is this so this is the the result of elaborating this just expression However, we also have this notation, this annotation, and then now we have to unify the annotation with the infer type. So 
so you have to unify this and and this and of course this uh, unification fails because we have here we have an explicit function type on the on one side and here we have an implicit function type on the other side and this is i think this is a classic example of this implicit uh, implicit lambda issue in agda but in the latest version of agda this works and i don't understand exactly why but it seems that uh, they added some some uh, some more sophisticated behavior to inductive constructors in general. So, so here, because we are trying to check just, then there is some magic. And the magic can solve this, this issue in the, in the latest version of Agda. But one year ago, it, 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 it couldn't solve it. And it is, not, it is not a complete solution. So if we are using some symbols which are not um, inductive constructor then usually still doesn't work so is, the, is this problem clear yeah I wonder what you think should be done differently on this example in order to not have the problem so okay so so here we are kind of branching into the big topic, which is called impredicative inference. And uh, let's not write it with all caps. So the solution is usually called impredicative inference, but, but this impredicativity is just a completely it, it's, a, it's a meaningless terminology. If you are coming from type theory, it's just a historical artifact why this is called impredicative. So in the type inference literature, it's impredicative, but it, it's, uh, it, it doesn't have anything to do with impredicativity in type theory. It means that we want to do uh, a type inference uh, such that any meta variable can be solved to be an implicit function type. So any meta variable can be instantiated to an implicit function type. Basically, that's what this means. And, and this is, this so should be the solution for this problem. And there are essentially two solutions. So two solutions. And the first solution is to delay checking until the checking time is known. So what would happen with this solution? So this, so here what would happen is that I want to check this lambda expression with an unknown type. But because the type is unknown, I say that I, I do kind of a delayed elaboration problem and I just continue. And, and then when I do the unification, okay, maybe I can also write it down in more detail. So when I have a check lambda x, x with alpha, then ju just delay, delay the checking. <coughs> and if we delay the checking, then we do not get this extra information from the lambda that uh, we have this, this beta, beta function type. So when we finish checking the just expression, we still only know this much, that we have an alpha, and then here we have a kind of a delayed lambda. Probably it should be also uh, annotated some, some way that this is kind of still delayed. And, uh, <coughs> and this has type maybe alpha. And then we can do the unification. So then we unify maybe alpha with, uh, with maybe this, this implicit function right and this unification succeeds so this just solves alpha to be an implicit function type and because now alpha is known so now we can resume resume checking lambda x x with 
with this type and then we get the correct uh, implicit lambda insertion. So, so this is a solution and this, is, this will be used in a less elegant way in uh, upcoming GHC, GHC 9.2, I think. Score quick look on predicativity. But in GHC, this is implemented in a more complicated way. And yeah, for, for some reason. So basically, it, it is in, in GHC, it is not implemented as a delay checking but it's implemented as a completely separate preprocessing step on every single application expression. So, so in GHC, whenever you have an application, like a neutral spine of application, and the discrete look impredicativity would do a preprocessing step, and then, uh, and then the preprocessing step just tries to find uh, solutions like this, and then there, there is also a normal phase. So we are doing some preprocessing on every neutral application. And if you look at the algorithm, it's, it's essentially the same as this delaying, but it's, it's just more complicated. But the pot so a potential problem with delaying. So what, what is a potential problem with delaying? The problem is, is that because here I'm just skipping over a term. So I, I am, I'm do doing nothing with this subterm here. I'm just skipping over it. So I do not get any new information from this term. So I don't learn anything from, from a delayed, from a term which, uh, such that the checking is delayed. So this is kind of a solution where we are not able to make progress in the presence of, uh, of, uh, of unknown checking type types. So we are only postponing this kind of problem, but we are not able to, to do a computation and, and inference in the presence of, of, this, of, this, uh, of this issue. So the issue is we have some insertions which are unknown and, uh, and this problem, uh, so this solution, it just kind of just say that I don't want to, to do anything about this. I just postpone this problem until it becomes clearer. Um, it seems to me that the problem is actually quite, uh, I think it matches the philosophy of bidirectional type checking on synthesis, doesn't it? Right? Okay. Shouldn't the, in, in the sense that information should not flow from the thing that is to be checked, right? So information should not flow from the thing which is to be checked. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not sure. Well, in other words, uh, is this problem, does this problem arise in practice? Yeah, so this, this you, mean, you mean this problem? Yes. Yeah, of course. So. So this problem is actually if if we do not if you do not handle this problem then it, it's prohibitively pro bad, and uh, because then what happens is that um, <coughs> so I want to do I want to do some some elaboration right, and then I get something which has unknown type, so I just postpone it, but then because I postponed it. I, I don't get any information from this term. And then because I don't get information from this term, I get even more unknown types later on. And then even more unknown types later on cause even more delay checking. So it kind of, it causes uh, this avalanche of delaying. So yeah, so the, so the problem is if, if we, are, we just simply kind of naively try to delay this problem, then uh, we, we learn too little information during elaboration, and we get this. Uh, uh, this uh, we are we are getting overwhelmed by all of this delaying, and then too too many things will be ambiguous. So we get lots and lots of yellow, prob 
errors in Agda if you try to do it in a naive way. So, so too much. Yeah, it's in Agda. And, and this problem has to be solved in some way. And uh, the usual way to solve this is that delaying is delimited. So we cannot keep delaying a problem forever. We, some, we have to confront our problems even if we have partial information. So we have to confront uh, checking at some point, even if we do not have perfect information about the, the checking type. And in GHC, the way this works, so GH, GHC 9.2 uh, delimits postponing to just a single neutral expression. So, so GHC uh, 9.2 will be able to solve this just example just fine. But because uh, GHC, what it does here is that it postpones the, the checking of this lambda. But, uh, but it's fine because, uh, because during the elaboration of this expression, we already learned what the checking type should be. So the checking type should be this thing. So we do an inference and then we do a unification. Uh, do a unification and we already know what the type should be so we can just uh, resume checking for this lambda but uh, in GHC 9.2 if we only learn what the type should be in a different lead binding or in a different expression somewhere else then it doesn't work because GHC says that after a single neutral expression it just resumes all pending problems so so this rooms every postpone checking after elaborating a single neutral expression. And this ensures that uh, we do not get this, uh, this cascade of, uh, of postponing. So, so GHC just says that if we don't learn what this should be after checking this particular expression, then we just do as usual. And I think that this is a completely fine solution. And probably I will do a variant of this. So in Setoid type theory, I, I will do something which looks, looks like this. Uh, because it's, it's, it's quite simple. So this means that the other solution, which is in my paper, is, uh, is kind of an overkill. <laughs> so, so there's a paper about this, but actually in practice I will not use it. I instead I will use something which is uh, which is just a very very simpler than, than this solution. And then the solution is is to to make progress in the presence of of unknown insertions. <coughs> so there, so what happens is that if I'm checking lambda x x. With, uh, with alpha, <coughs> then then here I'm making making a, an, an unknown number of, of implicit insertions. And the way that I can make an unknown number of uh, of insertions is by saying that. Uh, I have some some kind of uh, I have telescopes in the core syntax, and uh, and I also have an implicit lambda with a telescope argument, so I can have an implicit lambda such that I have like a lambda beta and then lambda x x, so the the output of this checking would be could be something like this. However, this is, uh, uh, this is a special kind of implicit lambda because it's a telescope of, 
uh, of arguments. And then the way it works is that uh, so if beta is sold to a concrete telescope, then uh, then this lambda computes to just an iterated implicit lambda. I mean, sorry, not beta, but the type of beta. So if the type of beta. So I, sorry, I, I should just write like maybe lambda y, and then the type of y is, is an unknown thing. So it's a, it's a, it's an unknown telescope. In this case, this lambda y uh, x x x computes to, to an iterated implicit implicit uh, lambda. So if this y has, for example, the type of uh, maybe x bool times uh, maybe a bool times times b bool. So basically, beta is just a it's a telescope, but it's it's just a record type. So if beta is solved to be a concrete record type, then then this computes to an iterated implicit lambda expression. So it becomes lambda y bool. Uh, sorry, not y, but a bool. And then b bool x x. Yeah. So the, so this solution is is just to say that we have we have an extra function type. So extra function type which is implicit, implicit pi, but the domain is known to be some telescope. So implicit pi with telescope domain and computes to iterated implicit pi. Definitionally. And this, this, so this is the, the kind of feature that we need if you want to represent unknown insertions and unknown, so unknown, uh, yeah. So this is what we need to represent unknown insertions. And if you have this extra type in the core, core syntax, then we can also do a slight generalization of unification. And, uh, and then this becomes a, a really powerful solution. But I think, so now I think that this, it's kind of an overkill because it's, it's powerful, but it requires to extend, so it requires us to extend the core syntax with this extra implicit pi with telescope domain. And it, it's not that painful in practice to only use this kind of solution. Um, this, I actually really like this solution. Uh, Two questions about it. So the telescope can it compute to an empty telescope to a zero element telescope? Uh, right, right, right. It, it can. So, so for example, yes. Yeah, so okay. If, if I have a type and which looks like A, and then this epsilon is the empty telescope B, then this is uh, this is definitionally the same as uh, as just B where A is okay maybe let's call it not a but x that x is just uh, t, t so if this is the empty record then it immediately computes just to, to just the code domain and to keep the core simpler uh hmm. would it actually make sense to only have this implicit pi with telescope domain rather than the other implicit pi as well. Uh, no, the other implicit pi is, is just, it's simpler because because everything is usually curried. So, mm -hmm. so whenever I'm, I'm doing insertions and inference, I always rely on currying to make it very clean. And if I say that I only have these telescopes, then I have to, I, I don't have this convenience anymore and I also I, I don't think it would even work for our purposes because for our purposes it's essential that uh, 
that the telescope implicit function is distinct, but it also computes to usual implicit functions because I, I only want it, to, so I only want this kind of function type to be kind of an internal detail. So just the mechanism for, for representing an unknown iterated implicit function. And, uh, and if I have a successful elaboration and every, every, meta, every, every meta variable is solved, then, then this kind of telescope pi types, they completely disappear. Just like uh, meta variables in general, they completely disappear if you have a successful elaboration. And that's, that's very important because if I want to do like a downstream compilation, so I want to do downstream compilation, doesn't have to deal with metas plus telescope files. So I, I view meta variables and also this additional telescope pipe uh, as, as mechanism uh, for inference. And then I want to completely eliminate them from the downstream, downstream pipeline. Could you speculate about uh, how Agda solves the problem with a maybe? Is that a, a special case checking rule for constructor applications or something? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I could speculate, but, but actually I, I looked at the source code and I was not able to find out where the magic happens. <laughs> Interesting. So, so I, I looked at the source code and uh, so I speculated that uh, that there is kind of a, a telescope handling so there is kind of a telescope handling of, of constructor applications so we say that we want to check just with a maybe right so if we check check a just with a maybe then we immediately know what the what the param parameter should be because just here just has some some parameter and the parameters are always completely determ determined by the by the inductive type which is the checking type so so that's when you, uh, when you say telescope handling do you mean that you have a, a spine for constructor applications uh, then right 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 so so we have like for we have a cons a x access and uh, and then, then what should happen in Agda is that this is not this is not elaborated one argument at a time, but rather or already in the pre syntax so already in the raw syntax we have we have a spine form here, like this, and then we know that this is an inductive constructor, and then we know that uh, that we have an inductive type as a checking type, so th this can be optimized because because now we know that this is a parameter and the parameter are always completely determ determined and I can we can immediately solve this this a in the application so if this a does not exist then we only have some hole here maybe we can immediately solve this hole to be a and that would solve this this particular problem but when I but when I looked at the source code um, I was not able to, to figure out, but I only spent like like one hour looking at this in the other source code. I also ask, uh, asked uh, about this on GitHub, but I haven't yet received any answer. Yeah, okay, so I ended up talking about this, this a bit and but uh, I mean, it, it's not essential that we have this, these uh, more sophisticated solutions. So if we only have this insert and this insert and this insert until name, it's still really simple and it works, works really well in practice. So we can look at these kind of examples and it, it works fine.
but it actually it took me a while to figure out that this is the the most that this is the nicest algorithmic implementation uh, which still reproduces the agda behavior Okay, so, so any, any, any questions? So now we are kind of finishing the, the, the officially allocated time. Uh, so maybe, maybe I can talk a bit about like what to do next week. So watch what should we do next week and uh, so now we don't have any any more elaboration zoo, but uh, but I can I can extend elaboration zoo until next week, and I, I thought that it would be a good to take a look at good evaluation in a kind of very simple way, and also here there are some open open uh, problems, and here we can also discuss some open problems, and. Uh, so in, in particular, I'm thinking about like what is a, a good unification algorithm and what is a good conversion checking algorithm which, which exploits this glued evaluation. So, so plus question. So what's a good conversion checking arc which exploits <coughs> Which exploits this uh, additional freedom. So, so the basic idea with this good evaluation, and here I will actually use the uh, the version which was invented by Ole, which is very very nice. I'm also using it in, in satellite type theory. So the basic idea is that uh, during evaluation, I want to have choice uh, whether to unfold some definitions, and and here in this particular so in this in this project. I can only do fu full evaluation and full normalization. But if I do some additional machinery, then I, I have some freedom to choose whether to unfold or not. And that's very good for optimizing the size of the elaboration output and also good for, for doing some, some heuristics like a syntactic equality checking, which does not compute everything. It only looks at an expression without unfolding all the definitions. But here, so we have like a lots of freedom, and and I think it's a, it's a it's an interesting problem to talk about, uh, like what kind of algorithms are possible, which do these kind of syntactic heuristics, and yeah, so so this could be could be a topic for next week, and probably I I, I will only do some some very simple anti lambda calculus implementation because I do not want to spend uh, too much time on this so I can do the untyped plus good evaluation uh, just for uh, for an educational example and then look at kind of quoting conversion checking with uh, kind of this unfolding choices Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, so if there are no other questions, I was wondering when will you talk about how to handle sigma types in all of these topics that we considered so far? Oh. I mean sigma sigma types could be added to here. Uh, so sigma types could be added here and they could be also added to the previous uh, the previous package or project in elaboration zoo and it's it's really simple. So so maybe I should just just add it. So it, it not complicates things in a interesting way or or non trivial way. Um, it, it does complicate uh, in the sense that if you want to do unification modulo sigma types, then uh, 
we can do we can do smarter things so if you want to do unification in the presence of sigma type then we can complicate unification algorithm significantly but we do not have to complicate it so we only want to support sigma types in a basic way then that's very very simple but if you want to have smart inference then that's a bit more complicated uh, so perhaps we can take a look uh, for one or two uh, times in this seminar series to look at how it changes the the inference and elaboration and all these steps that we have taken a look at so far with signal types, okay. how they change. Okay. okay, maybe so, so, so very neatly look at signal types. What's that? So a related suggestion could be to look at a general way to define uh, inductive data types. So I guess support for type families. And I guess stretching this even further co-inductive data types, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, here uh, there is a, a problem. And the problem is that I don't know what is the, the best way. So I. Uh, I, I haven't yet got to the, uh, gotten to this this point when I have a, a definite like a definitive idea about what's a good representation for inductive data types, and I know what I, I will use in in my set type theory, and uh, I will probably use eliminators, but uh, but only because I'm doing pretty complicated things, and I only want to do one complicated thing at a time. So I have like very general inductive types and it is much cleaner to say that I only have eliminators and then I try to make it work with like quotient inductive inductive types. So that's just that's just a very specific situation in satoid type theory that I'm using eliminators, but in general, so here we can like eliminators or like case trees plus recursion and we can you can make this uh, all kind of like algo like patterns, pattern elaboration, which is pretty complicated. I, I'm not sure. Maybe Ole, Ole, have you already implemented so <laughs> this before? So, do you have strong opinions? Uh, yeah, I agree. Algo like pattern elaboration is very complicated and uh, not really suitable for this kind of presentation, I think. Uh, uh, well, you, I could think about it. M maybe you could do a boil down version of it. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think, th I think uh, just doing kind of, a, so like a mini TT level of, of case splits and recursive definitions is, is is perhaps good for educational purposes. Yeah, exactly. So I think first we should take a look at some trivial implementation that may be not performant or not effective, but we can learn the ideas and then we can take a look at the more sophisticated implementations. It could be more easier to follow. Okay. So, so even if you don't know what is the best way to implement inductive and co-inductive types, it would be uh, meaningful for us to see what is the basic idea and how to deal with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so what was definitely possible is just to look at, okay, maybe it's, it's a bit too simple. So, so at the very least, we should have uh, like a, a generic implementation of inductive types so that we have all inductive families, for example. And even with eliminators, I, I haven't yet completely pinned. So, I, so I, I don't have the kind of experience uh, as with uh, this implicit argument, because here what you see, like this insert and insert prime functions, they are way, way, way simpler than, than what I first tried to implement quite a time ago. So they are kind of the crystallization of, of all of this work. And, 
and I don't have anything like this with uh, even for eliminators. So even for eliminators, I haven't yet uh, tried to figure out what would be the, the really elegant way of saying that, okay, we have inductive signatures and then we have constructors and then we have eliminators and how to represent it in the syntax. But, um, but maybe I should, okay, I should so just work. We, we, can, we can delay it a few weeks or months. It is not something that we, we need to do immediately, I believe. Just it good to have on the roadmap. Yeah, I mean, I, I I want to figure this out. So, so I want to figure this out, but I, I haven't yet figured it out, and I am not sure I can I can do it in in one week or two weeks even. Okay, but but I think this is quite enough for next time, so we can decide on, and I think we have many many topics, so. So this can continue for a, for a while before we run out of topics.